In my hands, I hold the brand new DJI Osmo Action 4. And today's video is going to be a complete beginner's guide to the Action 4. So in this video, I'm going to do a full unboxing of this camera. I'm gonna go through all the menu settings, and then I'm going to share the best settings that I recommend for getting the very best video, photo, time-lapse, and hyperlapse footage with the Osmo Action 4. And in order to make it as easy as possible for you to navigate this video, I've created a full table of contents below with each chapter title. That way you can skip ahead if there's a section that's more relevant for you, or if you need to go back and review a section again, it'll be simple for you to do. So for the unboxing process, I'm going to set up a camera that gives you a much closer view of this so that you can see this camera up close and so you can see all the menus when I'm setting them up. This is the packaging that the Osmo Action 4 comes in. And I've owned every single Osmo Action camera since the original Osmo Action. DJI continues to make their packaging smaller and smaller for their action cameras. This one basically fits in the palm of my hand. It's incredible how much they fit in here. If you look at the back of the package, these are all the items that are contained within it. So props to DJI for that great packaging. So to open the package, first thing we gotta do is get the shrink wrap off. Wanna gently get under a seam of the plastic here, just to get it started. Get the plastic off here. All right, and then we're just gonna pull right here where there's a screen arrow pointing down. We're gonna lift that up and pull this way. DJI kind of takes a cue from Apple with their packaging. I really like that. All right, so we're gonna open it up here and it's gonna have one side labeled accessories. And of course on this side is our camera and our silica gel. So first thing I'm gonna do is pull out the camera here. And this of course is tightly wrapped in plastic to protect it. And this plastic is just stuck down. You don't have to cut it. Open it up here and slide it out. Kind of like their packaging, they use this plastic a little better than that adhesive that they would wrap the camera around with. Uh, so that is also a nice design element. And when we open it up, there's of course gonna be the plastic right here. And it mentions tighten the lens protective cover before taking in water. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So I'm gonna set the actual camera aside so we can look at the accessories here. So in the accessories box, we have a couple different things. And by the way, this is just the standard combo. So there's nothing extra or special with this. This is just what you get with the 399 standard combo. So first thing in here, it's gonna be this USB-C cable right here. And in addition, the thumb screw is also in here. DJI finds a really good job of fitting a lot of components into a very tiny space, hence this very small packaging. So this is our thumb screw right here, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. But you actually don't need this thumb screw unless you're mounting the Action 4 to some type of mount that requires it. In addition, you've got the USB-C to USB-C cable. And we've also got the case right here with a few more goodies inside. All right, so in here, we have a lens hood that DJI has included. That lens hood is not something they included with the last one. Let's take a look at that. It does mention the camera is not waterproof when used with the Osmo Action lens hood. And we of course also have the battery down here. Let's get the battery out. We're gonna need that in a moment. And if you own the DJI Osmo Action 3, the battery from the 3 will also work in the 4. This battery, I believe, has the same amount of milliamp hours as the battery in the 3. That's correct, it has 1770 milliamp hours. You can see that right there. DJI's claims of battery life with the Action 4 are the same as the 3. 
about 160 minutes if you're using it in the 1080p, 24 or 30 frames per second. Of course, most are not going to use it in that. Your battery life isn't going to nearly be that when you're using it in 4K. We also have an adhesive mount here. So this one has a little bit of a curve to it. So this would mount on specific surfaces where there's a slight curve. So it wouldn't work for all surfaces. I don't recommend putting it on a car or something like that. I would not trust it to hold my camera. But if it's like on a desk or something like that, it should probably be just fine. And of course, down here, we also have the magnetic mount, which DJI was kind of first to design. And it's been one of those accessories that they have stuck with. And the great thing about this is you don't have to have the external cage right here in order to mount this. You can mount it horizontally without that. And this is a really strong magnet. It's got good, good grip there. Just have to make sure it latches into place first. Yeah, the grip is great. Now, if you do want to do vertical mounting with this, you do have to put it inside the cage. Get this mount off. So yes, if you want to vertically mount it, you do have to put it inside here. And the mount's gonna go right along here where it says DJI. Unfortunately, you can't vertically mount the camera. You have to have it inside the cage for vertical, but for horizontal, you do not need the cage. Gonna pull this off right here. So in order to put the camera in the cage, all you do is lift right here where there's the arrow and that kind of opens it up. And then what you want to do is you want to make sure the record button symbol here lines up. And what you have to do is you have to put it in from this direction. Push it down in, snap that into place, and it's in the cage. And then you're able to vertically mount it like that. And you of course can horizontally mount it while in the cage also, but you don't have to have the cage for the horizontal mounting. So I'm gonna take this back out of the cage and we're gonna get started. And we're gonna talk a little more about the camera body and where some parts are on that. And I'm gonna set all of these accessories aside for now. All right, so the first thing with the camera here, let's start on this side. This right here, you just slide that up, you push down and slide up, and that opens up to the battery door and the micro SD card slot. So in order to put the battery in, you're just gonna look for the contacts right here and you're gonna line them up with the contacts down in there. So it's gonna go in just like this. It's gonna click into place and your battery's in. Next, we're gonna put in the micro SD card and I need to go grab mine here, one moment. And the micro SD card that I own and recommend is the SanDisk Extreme. And it's really important to have the proper micro SD card. This isn't the only one that'll work well, but I've really liked SanDisk. They've done a great job in all the action cameras I've used them in, and they haven't let me down. Now, 512 gigabyte is quite large. You don't necessarily need one of that size, but I will link to this particular card in the description below in case you want to check it out. I typically recommend having at least 128, but if you're gonna do a lot of footage on a long adventure, then 256 is kind of a good minimum. So in order to put your micro SD card in, what you wanna do is you wanna have the lettering line up toward the inside, and you're gonna just gently push this down in. You can hear that nice click into place. And then we're just gonna shut the door by pushing down, sliding back down. So. If you see the red, that means it's not closed all the way. So if you see that, push it down, listen for that nice strong click. And then you know your battery door is closed and your camera is waterproof. So as I mentioned before, this is what the bottom looks like. And that's where you connect the mount. And the good thing about this mount is it only goes one way. If you put it the wrong way, it's gonna actually repel. The magnet's gonna push back. So to get the magnet on correctly, it's gonna basically pull itself into place. And then you just have to line it up and it's gonna fit nice and tight. There'll just be a slight little gap where you can see light through there at the top. 
Going around to the other side, what we have right here is the USB-C slot. So this is gonna be where you can charge the camera with the USB-C cable. And something to note about this camera is it does have the quick charge, just like the Osmo Action 3 did. So you can charge the battery on this camera from zero to 80% in about 18 minutes. It's very fast. The remaining 80 to 100%, that remaining 20% there, is going to take a little longer. So a full charge from zero to 100 is still gonna take approximately 45 minutes as long as you have the USB-C cable connected to a high enough wattage charging device. That's great, especially if you need to charge a battery quick. Maybe you forgot to charge it after your last adventure. So it's really nice for that. This button right here is the power button and it's also the quick switch button. So if you have it powered on and you wanna switch between some of your pre-programmed modes, you're gonna push this button. And looking on the top here, this is gonna be one of the microphones right here. And this of course is your record button right here. And coming around to the front, this is the lens cover right here. And something to note, if you're like me and you had ND filters with your Osmo Action 3, the ND filters will not be compatible with this, unfortunately. This is a slightly different size, but as far as how to remove the lens cover, it is the same type of design. It's threaded, and you just turn it counterclockwise to loosen it, and it'll pop off like that. And then to put it back on, just gonna pop it back on there, turn it clockwise until it's nice and tight. And it is important to note that DJI does say that this camera is not waterproof without the lens cover on. So make sure you have that on here. And while we're here, you can see here, this is the sensor size. It's that one over one thirds, which is a bigger sensor than the Osmo Action 3. We'll talk about later what that means, but the larger the sensor, generally better. It tends to result in better footage. So that's great to see. The aperture is still F 2.8 on here. That's unchanged. That's very common for action cameras. And then the field of view at the widest setting is 155 degrees, which is great. That's nice and wide. And down here, if you notice the O looks a little bit funny in the word action, this is where the sensor is for the color temperature. And of course on the back here is the rear screen. And it is important to note that both of these screens are touchscreen. So the front and the back are touchscreen. So the next step we need to take here is we need to install the DJI MIMO app before we power this on. Something really important to note is that app is required in order to do the initial activation on the Osmo Action 4. DJI will not allow you to activate it without the app. And this is what the DJI MIMO app looks like right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna power on the device. And when I power it on, the phone is going to detect it. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna click through, select my language, and if you don't wanna look up the app, all you have to do is just scan this QR code right here to download it. And as you can see, the app found this device. And it does let you skip, of course, you do have five times remaining, but eventually you do have to activate it and go through this. So I'm gonna click connect on my phone. I'm gonna click accept on the camera. And I'm gonna set my phone down here. And we're gonna go through the process. We're gonna allow access and click next. You're gonna to wanna to confirm your account info. And we're gonna activate. If you don't have a DJI account yet, it'll prompt you for that. Next, it's gonna prompt if you want to get the DJI Care Refresh. If you already purchased it, there's an option down here to activate. I'm going to click skip. And activation successful. So if there are any firmware updates, it's going to detect that right here, and it's gonna prompt you to install the initial firmware. And it kind of gives you a tour of the buttons on here. You can go through those, talks about the screen gestures. So I'm gonna skip through this. It's gonna mention you should update the firmware regularly, which you can do through the app. And of course, here's the initial firmware update. So this initial firmware, it's got a long list of stuff here that it includes. 
It's really important to have on there. And we're gonna get into these features a little bit later on, but I'm gonna let that firmware install and then we'll get back to it in a moment. It is important to leave your camera powered on while the firmware does install. And it can take a little bit to download it depending on your wireless speeds at the time. So I'm going to let that finish and then we'll pick up where we left off. And while we wait on the firmware, I'm going to get this mounted on a tripod so that my camera's not doing this while we take a look at some of the settings. So let's get that mounted. So in order to mount it, what we're gonna do is we're gonna just pop it on right there. And we're just gonna tighten this thumb screw. And you don't have to over tighten it, just wait until it gets snug there. Then should be good to go. All right, so we're gonna be prompted to click install now for the firmware. And sometimes it'll lose its connection. If it does, just click connect again. And it's gonna reconnect right there. And it's gonna prompt you to join the Wi-Fi network now because the phone needs to push the firmware update over to the camera. All right, so it did connect after the second time. And then on the screen, it's gonna say update in progress, wait two minutes. So we're gonna let that update proceed. The percentage is gonna to continue to count up on the phone here. And it's gonna kind of give you a nice status to follow along with, which is great. So you don't wonder what's going on. All right, so what it's gonna do is it's gonna reboot now. I'm gonna click done there. It's gonna make that nice friendly tone. That means it has successfully updated the firmware. And it, it's going to do one more reboot after that by the looks. And it's gonna tell you that it's updated. All right, so now that we've updated that firmware, it's time to take a look at the menu and go through some of the settings here. So in order to get to the general menu, what you wanna do is you wanna go to the top of the screen. You're gonna swipe down to get to the general menu. First button here, if you click on it, it's gonna tell you this is where you can create and manage custom modes. So this is where there's gonna be five different modes that you can save once you've keyed in settings. So we're gonna do this later. Speaking of modes, we have the QS button here, which is the quick switch. And when you tap to enter that, it's gonna give you a few different options. You can have the voice prompt turned on if you want to. I usually turn that off, so I'm going to do so. But there are voice prompts you can use to quick switch it. And basically screen switch, if you select this, this makes it part of the quick switch menu. I don't usually make it part of my menu. I like to just have it go between the video, the photo, time-lapse, that type of thing. So I'm gonna keep that unselected there. The defaults with the quick switch are to include the photo and the video but I also like to include slow motion, time-lapse, hyperlapse, and playback. I like to include them all. That way when I'm toggling this button, I can see all of those there and I can quickly switch between them. I don't have to bring those up in a different way. So I like to select all of those. And this next one here allows you to adjust the screen brightness. The default is 100%, but I often like to drag this back to about 90. It does save a little bit of battery power and I find that I don't need it 100% brightness. So that little bit of extra battery saved is kind of a nice bonus. This next one here, this one has a lot of options under it. The snapshot mode, basically that allows you to hit the red button here. If it's powered off or in sleep mode, it'll immediately turn it on and start recording. So if you want that enabled, just keep it enabled here. And there are options. You can use the last setting or you can have a default to video or hyperlapse. I generally do not have the snapshot mode on. I'm just turning that off. But if you do have it on, it's nice to have it available for your last setting video or hyperlapse. You can pick any of those. And if you do the single screen preview, if you turn this on, there's only gonna be one touch screen available when you do that. So if you wanna unlock the back screen, you would do that. Or if you wanna use the front screen, you would swipe and tap up on that. I like to keep this disabled. I like to have both screens available at all times. So I'm gonna put that back to the default. 
voice control if you would like to be able to voice control your camera. You want to select the language here and then you want to turn that on right here. And if you look here, there's a list of uh, voice commands too. So there's some real basic ones there. There's four basic ones. The default is to have this off and I'm going to keep it off for my use case. I actually don't use the voice control, but if you want to, it is available. For the OTG connection, this is gonna primarily apply to an Android device. And it kind of explains right there what you have to do. But basically you need to use a Type-C to Type-C PD cable, which is included with the OTG connection. And that basically allows you to transfer the files from the camera to an Android device. And of course your Android device does have to support it if you use that. For the wireless connection, it's going to show you the uh, device name and password, which each camera comes with a unique device name and password. And that's going to be for connecting it from your phone to the camera. And the Wi-Fi frequency, you can select the 2.4 or the 5.8. In my case, the 5.8 is grayed out. It's not an option, so I'll be keeping it at the 2.4. And reset connection, of course, you can do this down here if you want to reset the connection and the Wi-Fi password. For the video compression, this is an important setting. HEVC or H.264 is available. It's important to note that there is a difference here. The HEVC is more intensive for you to add it on a computer. The HEVC is also known as the H.265 codec. But if you select the H.264, it is more compatible but it will result in a larger file size. So usually I recommend just keeping the HEVC enabled as the default. Like I said, it is a little bit more intensive to edit those on a device, but the HEVC is going to allow you to use all of the possible modes on the camera. For the sounds, you can adjust the volume of the device. I like to set these to medium. The high is kind of ridiculously loud, but the low is kind of a little bit too quiet. I like medium. Uh, I like to hear the sound to know that when I press the button, it actually worked. So, you know, if it's kind of noisy outside, medium is great. But if you don't care about the sound at all, you can set it to mute. You can have it off completely. For the grid, I like to have a grid on. I like to do the uh, normal grid, but you can also do diagonal and grid and diagonal if you want to, which is nice to have that option that can help you with centering stuff or if you kind of want to use that rule of thirds with your video or your photo. So I'm going to keep that at grid. And then going down here, time code. Time code is something that DJI did not originally have on the Osmo Action 3. They added it with the firmware update later on, but now it comes with the Osmo Action 4 built into it. If you want to use that time code, your camera can be synchronized by the system settings and it can be synchronized by the time code synchronizer using the USB-C port. So for using multiple cameras, this can kind of be useful for that. For most people, this isn't really going to be helpful, but you can also do the time code display and have that display. For the naming management, this is where you can adjust the naming convention that he uses on your micro SD card for your files. So you can go in here for folder name, you can set up any kind of customization you want there essentially. We have different letters, different numbers, I usually just keep a default, but it is a nice option to have. And I like the file naming default where it has the date there. That's really helpful for me to have that at the start of it. So I just keep it as the default. So the screen off when recording, this is basically the default for when the screen goes off if you're continuously recording. So the default there is five minutes. I usually just do never here. I don't like the screen to go off and generally I'm not recording long, long clips. But if you are someone who does really long clips, like let's say you're riding a bike and you have it rolling the whole time, or you're using it like a dash cam in your car, then you may want to set this because it's going to help save battery life. You don't have to have the screen on. It can still be recording, but I like to see what I'm recording at all times. So I set that to never. And of course the auto power off setting is what it means here. This is uh, the camera's going to automatically power off if it's on for a certain amount of time with no activity happening. The default is five minutes. I'm going to set it to two minutes. I like mine to power off after two minutes if it's on with no activity. And of course there are two status LEDs on here, one right here, and then there's another on the front. 
I like to keep those on. Those lights are very helpful. Horizon calibration, I recommend doing this the first time. Let me show you how to do this. So we're gonna detach it from the mount and we're gonna set it right here. And I'm gonna click confirm and it's gonna do the calibration. I do recommend doing this the first time, but after that, generally you don't need to do it for a while. I usually just do it about once a month just to make sure everything is calibrated there. And then it, sh it will show calibration complete and you can click confirm. All right, going down further for continue last live stream. If you're doing live streaming, this is going to relate to that. And you do, of course, have to have the DJI Mimo app installed to do the live streaming. But if you have that enabled, it will offer you that option if you have a live stream. So what it's going to do, the camera will continue the last live stream after it's stopped. So that can be a nice feature if you're live streaming and you had to stop it or if it stopped on you. So this, like I said, this will not show because I don't have any live streaming that I've done yet with this camera. Something brand new with the Osmo Action 4 is a Bluetooth remote control. I don't have the remote control, but if you do, there are some options that you can select like wake up the camera, which is a nice feature to have if you want to buy the remote to pair with this. For the language that of course I already selected, the date and time, I just recommend checking this to make sure it is correct. Mine is correct right now. If you click on the time, you can readjust it there. And the date, same thing. And what I do recommend the first time you put your micro SD card in, I do recommend formatting it. But do note that if you do format it, it will erase any and all data you have on that micro SD card. So make sure anything that you want on there is backed up first before you reformat it. It's gonna format it. This of course is a fresh card that I stuck in for the first time. It's already empty, there's nothing on it. All right, formatting successful. And then of course down here, factory reset. If you click confirm, this is gonna wipe out all the settings on the camera and it's gonna reset it as if you just pulled it out of the box. So I'm not going to do that. Device info, it's going to show you your camera name and your serial number, your firmware version, the camera firmware version. A quick start guide is also going to be here. And you could export a log. So exporting that log to the SD card is generally going to be if you need to do some troubleshooting and you need to send that log to DJI. If you're having a problem with the camera, that's why you would do that. But I'm going to click cancel. And there is the quick start guide on here, which is kind of nice to have that built into the camera. You can toggle through, shows you some different things about the camera. So it's kind of neat they built that in. And that is it for that menu. We're gonna go back and we're gonna go here now. And if you click that button, that's going to lock the orientation. I like to have that on because I don't want my orientation to change from horizontal to vertical. I like it to stay the same. And right here is the screen lock. So if you do lock the screen, the way to unlock it is to swipe up and it'll unlock it. That's generally going to be used like if you're underwater and you don't want the water on this to start pressing random things on the screen. That's when you're going to want to use that. Right here is another place to enable or disable the voice control. So if you click on it, when it's yellow, it's enabled. When it's not yellow, when it's white, it's disabled. Then one more option over here is to enable or disable the full front screen display. I like to have the front screen full and on, so I'm gonna keep it right there. So those are all the general settings on the general menu. So we're gonna swipe back up. And next I'm gonna show you uh, the different gestures you can use on the screen to get to different things. So up here's the battery. If you tap on it, it's gonna show you the percentage and the percentage goes away after a couple seconds. I'm at 32% right now. So I'm actually gonna probably plug this in in a moment here so we don't run out of battery. So I've got my handy anchor cable here hooked to a wall charger. So I'm gonna slide this down and I'm gonna hook in the USB-C cable to charge it. And it of course is going to default to the fast charging. So you're gonna see that battery percentage climbing quite quickly, even while we're using it. Up here, the SD card shows how many hours and minutes of footage can be captured in any given mode. 
If you are in photo mode, it's gonna show you how many photos you can take with those current settings as well. And of course, when we change the video settings down here, this is going to change as well. The play button right here, that's going to be if you want to view your files on the SD card. There, of course, are no files right now. So we're gonna click confirm there. And down here at the bottom, if you click on that, it's going to allow you to toggle between the different modes. So that's one way to get to those. And of course, down here, if we click on this, this is where we're gonna adjust all of our settings. So I'm gonna toggle back out of that. We're gonna get to that in a moment. And then over here, if you click on this, this is where we're gonna adjust a lot of our advanced settings here. So what I'm gonna do while we're here is I'm gonna click Pro. And when you click Pro, you're gonna see a whole bunch of other settings become available here. We're gonna get into those in a moment. So first thing I wanna do is I wanna go down here and I wanna to toggle this to video mode. So let's get into those video mode best settings. All right, so for the video mode, we're first gonna start off clicking down here. And what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna show you this right here. If you click on this, this is if you want to set loop recording, you can set the duration there. I have loop off, but you can actually set the loop recording. So what it'll do is it's going to record up to that amount and then it's going to start over again. So if you were to select five minutes on here, it's going to record a continuous five minute video. And then what it's gonna do is it's gonna overwrite the older footage with the new footage at select intervals. So if you're trying to capture spontaneous moment like fishing, this is a great way to keep recording while also saving space on the micro SD card. I don't like to do that because I don't wanna accidentally lose something that I didn't want to, so I like to keep it off. But it could be useful for certain use cases, like it mentions fishing. So if you're doing fishing with this, keep that in mind, that could be useful. So for all recording, I recommend two modes. I recommend either using 4K 4x3 or 4K 16x9. So which one should you choose? It's basically going to come down to one thing. Do you want to edit the footage later on? If you do, I recommend using the 4K 4x3 because it gives you a little bit more vertical resolution to work with. You can change what part of your frame is in the frame when you edit on a 16x9 timeline later on. You have a little bit more footage to work with and it's also a full sensor readout. If you do 4K 16x9, that's going to crop the footage inside the Osmo Action 4. Your 4x3 footage inside the camera, it's going to crop it to 16x9. When you're editing, you could zoom in and have a little bit of flexibility, but you're not gonna have that full 4K resolution where you can move it up and down to reframe it. That's really the biggest distinction. I recommend doing 4K 4x3 so that you have the leeway for editing. But like I said, if you don't want to edit, do the 4K 16x9 and that's fine. In addition, if you want to do 4K 120, then you have to do the 4K 16x9 because you can only go up to 60 frames per second in the 4K 4x3. So that's another important thing. When I select that, you can see the additional frames become available. So what I like to do here is I like to do the 4K 120 and then save it as a preset with my other settings. So I like to save that as my slow motion mode. I'll show you at the end how to save those presets. And then I like to save a 4K 4x3 60 and a 4K 4x3 24. Those are kind of my three main video modes. So what I'm gonna do right here to start with though is I'm gonna do a 4K 4x3 60 because that does allow for some slow motion flexibility. If I record in 4K 4x3 60, if I'm using a 24 frames per second timeline, I can slow that footage down all the way to 40% of the original speed. If I'm doing a 30 frames per second timeline, I can slow it down to 50% of the original speed. Up here is the Rocksteady setting and I'm going to turn Rocksteady on. You can use Rocksteady Plus, but it, you can see when I did that, it introduces a crop. Now having Rocksteady on does introduce a crop to begin with as well, but it's a pretty minor crop with off versus Rocksteady. But if you go to Rocksteady Plus, it is quite a crop. So unless you're doing something like really intense running or mountain biking with a lot of jumps, stuff like that, I recommend keeping it to Rocksteady so you don't lose out on some of that footage. But here's one great thing about the Osmo Action 4. If you turn off stabilization, 
this does mention you can get gyro data in certain modes. It spells it out really clearly here, but in wide angle videos, you can have gyro data with the following settings. And then it lists those out here. That's an interesting error message. I don't have the device recording and it's telling me it overheated. I will be interested when I take out this camera later, to test it out. I'll let you know if there's any overheating. With the wide angle gyro data, that's great to have that. The Osmo Action 3 did not have any gyro data available, which I was actually pretty bummed about. Because there are use cases when I'd like to have the stabilization off, especially in low light conditions, where having the stabilization on can sometimes create jittery ghosting in the footage, which I'll give you a tip later on to prevent that on here. There's a setting that you can use to do that. And sometimes I just want that full frame readout, or I want to use it with a gimbal and have the gyro data. So props to DJI for including that gyro data out of box. Now, curiously, it doesn't list anything below 100 frames per second with the 16 by nine. But if you're in the four by three, you get the 24 all the way up to the 60. And that's a big advantage to using the four by three is you can have that gyro data available as well. That might be one of the highlights of this camera for me. I'm really excited about that. So let's go back to Rocksteady. I'm gonna keep Rocksteady on and I recommend Rocksteady as the default. So next, what we wanna do is we wanna set the parameters over here. So like I did earlier, make sure Pro is turned on. If you turn Pro off, you're not gonna have a lot of options available here. You're gonna have a few, but not many. When you turn Pro on, it opens up a lot of additional settings here. The first one we're gonna change here is the exposure. I like to put this down to negative 0.3. And then over here is our ISO configuration. So the number on the left is the ISO minimum. The number on the right is the ISO max. What I recommend setting for this camera is 100 to 1600, but I don't recommend having the ISO set any higher than 1600 because the footage is going to get a lot of noise and grain if you go into low light and it's not going to look good. So I recommend doing the 100 to 1600 for the range. And if you do select the M over here, you can have full manual control over a lot of these settings. But I also like to set the shutter speed range here as well. And what's nice about this is if you're going in and out of low lighting, you can set the shutter speed range here to a limit as well. I recommend doing this if you're going into low lighting and you're noticing jittery ghosting footage, you wanna change your value here so the minimum is one over 200. As long as your minimum is one over 200 or higher, you're not gonna have any of that jitter or ghosting. What the camera's gonna do is it's going to boost your ISO as far as it needs to in order to offset that low lighting, but it's not going to lower the shutter value. When the shutter value gets lower than one over 200, like down to one over 100 or one over 60, there's gonna be jitter and ghosting in your footage and it's not going to look good. If you're doing low lighting, I'm gonna talk about those specific settings later, but in, in daylight, if you're going in and out of shade, I recommend setting this to one over 200 to one over 8,000. That way your shutter never gets slower than a one over 200. And of course, if you're using ND filters, I'm gonna have a whole separate video on that. So keep this at auto, but adjust these parameters so that there are those limits in place. And it's gonna give you the very best footage. So for white balance, you can do auto here, but I recommend doing manual. And if you're outside and it's just normal daytime, I recommend setting this to 5,000K. I find that's gonna be the best white balance to work with. You can always adjust it later on, but when it's auto white balance, your clips are going to change if you're trying to put them all into one project. The individual clips are gonna have probably a different, slightly different white balance value. And it can be really tricky to edit those all together and have them look the same. So I like to set 5,000K as a static value. For the color profile, this is important here. And this is gonna be another determination of whether you're going to edit the footage later on or not. If you want to grade the footage, I recommend selecting the D-Log M. And part of the reason is that's also going to give you the 10 bits of color. The 10-bit color gamut is more than a billion colors versus the default normal color profile is the 8-bit color gamut, which is only up to 16 million shades. So 16 million versus 1 billion is a huge difference. So I'm going to select the D-Log M 
because I like having that widest color gamut available so I can really bring out all those different shades later on when editing. For the field of view, you've got several different options here. You can do that standard de-warp, which is going to make stuff look linear. You can see the lines on my table here. They're nice and straight when I have that set. If you do wide, there is that fisheye appearance. If you do ultra wide, there's going to be an even wider fisheye appearance. So as a default, if you're not going to add it, I definitely recommend sticking with the standard de-warp. And even if you are going to add it, I find that can be the best one to stick with a lot of the time, unless you want to do correction later on for that lens. But if you're biking or doing something where you have really scenic vistas around you, I recommend the ultra wide. It's gonna give you a lot wider field of view. The wide is in between that standard de-warp and the ultra wide. And down here, there's an image adjustment option. And I love it that DJI included this on the Osmo Action 4. For the first time, you can actually adjust the sharpness values and you can also adjust the noise reduction. So for the sharpness, you can go all the way up to two, which is gonna be the highest sharpness. And then you also can go all the way down to negative two, which is gonna be the softest image possible. For this, I like to do negative one for the sharpness. I find that gives me the best results. There's a little bit of sharpness there, but not too much. Because when I'm editing later on, I can always bring out the sharpness and it's gonna look great. I can fine tune that. If you're not gonna edit later on, I recommend sticking with zero or one, but I don't recommend going all the way to two. Two is really sharp and when sharpness is high like that, it tends to look bad. So I recommend sticking with one if you're not going to edit. And then there are the noise reduction values as well. You can go from negative two all the way to one. For noise reduction, I just keep that at zero. I don't want the camera to do noise reduction. I can do that later on when editing. I'm gonna click confirm. Then over here is our audio options. And for this, I like to select channel stereo. And I do recommend using an external mic when possible with this. I like using the DJI wireless mic set here, which you can conveniently plug that into the USB-C port with the uh, connector on here. But at the same time, you can also wear one of those mics and record direct to the mic. And then you can sync it with the audio from the camera later on. In some ways that's the easiest. Then you don't have this big piece here sticking out of it for the mic because you have to have it plugged in with the USB-C connector right here. So that's the method I prefer. I just prefer to use it offline. But the audio, there is this wind noise reduction on here, which offers you on or off. If I'm going to use an external mic and sync it later on, it doesn't really matter what setting I'm using. But if I am going to use just the audio from here, I recommend having the wind noise reduction turned on. That's going to give best results. 4K24, rock steady on. 4x3, built-in microphone on the Osmo Action 4. Kind of rotating this around to see how it does with the highlights and clouds as well. See what kind of detail it picks up with those best settings. So now that I have my settings configured here for this, I'm going to go up here and I'm gonna go to this and I'm gonna save it as C1. And then what it does is it lists out all those settings I configured right there. I'm gonna click confirm. And then next I'm gonna go back here and I'm going to set my 4K 120 and I'm gonna save a preset for that as well. And I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna save this as setting number two. And then finally, I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna set 4K 4x3, 24 frames per second. And for this one, I'm gonna do standard de-warp because this is gonna be generally when I'm talking to the camera and I don't want the fisheye effect because that can really mess with human subjects. The rest of these settings, I'm all gonna keep the same. And I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna save that as custom setting number three. Let's talk really quick about some low light settings you can key in if you would like to. So for low light, I recommend doing 
either 4K 4x3 or 4K 16x9, and I recommend doing either 24, 25, or 30 frames per second. And the reason for that is that's going to allow you to slow down the shutter speed as much as possible. And when you slow down the shutter speed, more light is let into the camera. So I recommend doing that. I'm gonna do 4K 4x3 24. And I recommend for the very best results, have Rocksteady turned off. Because now that you have the gyro data, you can use gyro flow if you would like to, to stabilize that footage when editing. Now, if you don't want to edit and you don't want to use gyro flow, then I recommend using a gimbal with this camera. If you don't want to use a gimbal, you can keep Rocksteady on, but you will want to do the enhanced low light option. But what I do is I keep Rocksteady off, and then I'm gonna stabilize that footage later on. And when I have this final video out, I will have some samples there to show you, but that's what I recommend doing there. And then over here, I recommend adjusting some parameters. You can keep it right there at zero. And for the shutter speed, we wanna adjust the range. We wanna let it go all the way down to one over 24. That way, if it wants to, it can slow down the shutter speed as slow as it needs to. Which of course, one over 24 is 360 degree shutter angle. It can't go any slower than that when filming 24 frames per second. For the ISO range, I do keep it the same, the 100 to 1600. And then I'm gonna click confirm. And down here for the image adjustment, I'm gonna keep all of that the same as well. And I'm going to go up here and I'm gonna save one more preset. All right, next let's go to a couple other modes and I wanna take a look at those with you and show you the settings I recommend. All right, so to get to the next mode, we have a couple ways we can do that. We can hit the quick switch, which is gonna, it's gonna toggle between our presets. So we can keep clicking that and then it's gonna get to our modes that way. So I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna go to photo mode next. You also, of course, can just swipe in from the left and you can toggle between them that way as well. So for the photos, first of all, down here, I recommend doing four by three. That's a very common photo aspect ratio. That of course gives you some cropping flexibility later on too, if you want to. You can have a countdown here if you want a timer from when you hit this to when the photo takes. Generally, unless I have it set up taking a photo from a distance, I'm gonna keep this to off. And then for photo mode, we're gonna go over here, adjust our parameters. So for the EV combi, I like to do the negative 0.7 EV, so it doesn't blow out the highlights and it gives me maximum control later on. For the ISO range, I like to set that 100 to 1600. I'm generally gonna keep the settings auto for the shutter speed, but if you're doing a photo with a slow shutter speed to capture motion blur, like of a waterfall or something like that, then you may wanna adjust your shutter speed up here to something like two seconds. I've linked to a video above where I talk about this. All of the same principles will hold for this one. But if you put on a dark enough ND filter, you don't have to adjust the shutter speed. The camera will do it automatically for you. So generally what I recommend is I recommend letting the shutter adjust automatically, but doing EV comp of negative 0.7, and the ISO range 100 to 1600. For the white balance, I generally keep that set to auto for photos because it's a static photo. You can always adjust that later on. For the field of view, I keep that at wide, but if you do want to edit it later on and not correct the lens, then you wanna do standard de-warp. And you can get a photo where you don't have to adjust that later on. For the format, I like to select JPEG and RAW because that raw photo is gonna give you the most editing flexibility later on. There's gonna be a lot more details there you can bring out. But at the same time, you get the JPEG, that's there for easy sharing if you wanna do quick edits before sharing. And those are the photo mode settings. I don't have any further tweaks to make on that mode. So next, we're gonna go over here to slow motion. Now slow motion, I already set a mode for that. So if you want to, the 4K 120, that's gonna be available there as an option. And if it's on a 30 frames per second timeline, that's gonna slow it down to 25% of the initial speed or four times slower. 
But if you want to slow it down by eight times, you have to go down to 1080p, where you can do that 240 frames per second. And of course, a little bonus here, if you do 4K 120 on a 24 frames per second timeline, that's gonna allow you to slow it down to 20% of the original speed or five times. So I usually keep it at 4K 120 because I like to have the highest quality possible. And basically, if you configure the slow motion in this mode, that frees up one of your presets that you can then have available to save for something else. So I'm just gonna key in my defaults that I did for the other one. Color, I'm gonna do D log M. White balance, I'm gonna do 5000K. Field of view, I'm gonna keep that at wide. And then down here, I'm gonna do my negative one for sharpness and my zero for noise reduction. Let's go to the next mode. Time-lapse. So time-lapse, these settings are going to depend if you're doing a time-lapse during the day or if you're doing a night-lapse. So for the time-lapse, first of all, there are some default settings that DJI has here. And if you wanna work with those, great, you can do that. The defaults are usually pretty good, but I'm going to go to custom here and I'm going to swipe up to set the parameters. So if it's a daytime time-lapse, generally you want the interval anywhere from two seconds to five seconds. I'm gonna keep it at three seconds as a default there. For the duration, I like to put it to infinity. I don't like my time-lapse to stop. It might stop in the middle of a really great moment and I might come back later and wish I'd had it still going. So I'm gonna keep that at an infinity. And for the resolution up here, I wanna keep that at 4K. I want the highest resolution possible. And this of course is going to be a video time-lapse by default here. But if you wanna do a photo time-lapse, I'll show you how to do that as well. For the time-lapse for, for these settings, I like to keep these pretty similar to the video settings. So there's a couple different options here. If you want to kind of keep this auto settings, then I recommend doing 100 to 200 so that the ISO lighting isn't changing on you during the time lapse. But my true best settings with this are to set the ISO to 100. And for the shutter speed, you're gonna have to adjust it based on the lighting of your scene because what'll happen here is the EV is going to show you when it's properly exposed. So in the lighting right here, in order to properly expose it, I would have to bring this down to pretty slow shutter speed. I would have to bring it way, way down. But if you're outside in the daylight, you can adjust this and you wanna basically get it to where that EV comp is around about negative 0.3 to negative 0.7. That's gonna give you the best results. I usually recommend negative 0.3 if it's gonna be a video file that you don't want to edit. But that's one of those secrets that will prevent the flicker if you set that shutter manually. So I recommend ISO 100 and shutter speed manual there. It's gonna give you the very best results. For white balance, I recommend setting this to a static value as well. You don't want your white balance changing on you during your time lapse, so I'm gonna keep that at 5,000K. If you are specifically doing sunset or sunrise, then I do recommend bumping this up to about 6,500K. It's gonna really bring out those colors and they're gonna look true to color. But again, you can always adjust the white balance later on when editing if you want to, but I definitely recommend setting it to a static value. And for the field of view, I recommend wide. You wanna capture that landscape with your time-lapse. I don't recommend doing standard D-warp as that crops it quite a bit. And down here, you can adjust the format. So like I said, you can do video plus JPEG, video or video plus raw. I highly recommend the video plus raw because later on, if you want to go back and edit individual photos, you're going to have those available to edit. And it's gonna really be some nice flexibility for you. You can really bring out a lot of detail in those. So those are the settings I recommend for the daytime time-lapse. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swipe down and save that as a preset. And I'm actually gonna go back here and overwrite my 4K 120 and make that the time-lapse mode because I have my slow motion for the 4K 120. I don't need to occupy a preset with that. And then we're gonna go back to time-lapse mode once more, 
because we actually want to set this for night lapses as well. So when you click into that, we wanna go back here to custom and we're gonna to wanna to set the interval. So for time lapses at night, night lapses, I generally recommend 15 seconds all the way up to 40. So if there's something like a moon in the sky or you're in a suburban area or a city area where there's plenty of light, your interval doesn't have to be as high. You could have something as low as a couple seconds all the way up to about 15. If it's a real dark night sky, you don't have any light pollution and no moon, you generally wanna go up to about 30 seconds for that interval. And as we'll see in a moment, depending on what we adjust our shutter speed to, the interval will adjust as well. Because if you have your shutter speed set to something like 30 seconds, but you're doing a video and photos, by default, it's gonna go up to something like 40 seconds. So I'll show you that in a moment but I like to keep the interval consistent here. You don't want that changing on you. So if it is a real dark sky, you generally wanna do 25, 30, or 40. I'm gonna keep it at 30, and I'm gonna keep it at infinity. Then we're gonna go over here, and for the exposure, for nighttime time lapses, we really need to adjust this slower. So we're gonna get down here into the seconds, and you're gonna see it's super overexposed, of course. But if it's a dark night sky and I want the 30 second interval, then I wanna set this to 25 seconds and that should still allow me to do the 30 seconds. Now, if you have the interval set to 40, you can go all the way up to 30 seconds and it's gonna keep the shutter open for 30 seconds, which is gonna allow a lot of light into here. It's gonna capture as many star details as possible. But I generally keep it at 25 because if I have a 40 second interval, my night lapse isn't gonna be as long either. And for the ISO, I recommend setting it to a static value. If you're in a city doing a night lapse, you might want this at something like 200 or 400 if there's a lot of light. If there's a moon in the sky, you generally wanna do about 800. But if you're going for the Milky Way and a lot of star details, I generally recommend 1600. You can play around with 3200 too if you want to, but generally there's a lot of noise and grain and it becomes unusable essentially. So I try to pick 1600 as a nice balance there. For the white balance for night lapses, I recommend doing anywhere from 3200K to about 4000K. I think the sweet spot that I find is about 3800K. So I'm gonna keep it right there. For the field of view, I definitely recommend wide. And then for the format, I recommend doing video plus raw especially for night lapses, you really want that raw. It's gonna give you maximum control and you're gonna get the very best results this camera can do. So when we go back here and check, you'll see it did bump the interval to 40 seconds by default, but I can move it back to 30. And then I just wanna check over here to make sure it kept our 25, it did. So we're good to go there. I'm going to swipe down and I'm gonna save this as my final preset. Then we've got one more mode to set here. And that's gonna be hyperlapse. Hyperlapse, I love, they're a lot of fun. So the settings are pretty easy also. I recommend just keeping auto for the rate. And here, of course, you wanna make sure hyperlapse is selected. Up here, recommend doing 4K. It's gonna give you the very best results. Then over here, we're gonna do some similar settings to what I've set before. I wanna set that shutter speed range to the one over 200 to one over 8,000. That way our footage doesn't get any jitter or ghosting to it. Then for the ISO range, I wanna set that from 100 to 1600. And then I'm gonna click confirm. For the white balance, I wanna set that to static value. Generally, again, 5,000 K if it's in the daylight. I'm gonna click confirm color. I wanna do D log M if I'm gonna edit later on. If I'm not gonna edit, keep normal and that'll be fine. For hyperlapses, I like to have wide or ultra wide because oftentimes you're gonna be getting a landscape around you. But if you are in a city with buildings and you want those buildings to not have that Boeing fisheye effect, you wanna go with standard D warp. In most any other setting, I recommend choosing wide or ultra wide. Generally, I stick with wide as the default there. And then down here, I like to do the custom adjustment again. I like to do negative one for sharpness and zero for the noise reduction. 
And since hyperlapse is its own mode there, I don't typically save a preset for it. I like to keep it right there. So there you have it. Those are all of the best settings that I recommend for the DJI Osmo Action 4. DJI has made some nice improvements on this camera and added a lot of new features. And if you'd like to learn more about this camera or how to do more advanced things on this, I'm going to have a lot more videos coming that relate to this camera specifically. So if you haven't already subscribed, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of those videos. And if you found this video helpful or useful, please hit that like button. It helps me a whole lot.